So today we'll be talking about functions. We'll be continuing uh, our discussion from last time. And something that was curious that we learned last time was that functions, well, we know that they take arguments, right? We know that they can take input. And in the past, we discussed that they can take you know, inputs like numbers and strings. But last time, what we learned is that functions can take other functions. That's interesting. So what this means is that we can create a function. Can everyone see the screen up there? Yeah. Yes? yeah. Okay. So we can take, create a function. And this function can actually take as an argument, as a, for example, a completely other function. So I can call f and give it another function as an argument. I could just as easily, actually, Jesus, how does this work? Oh, here we go. I could put this into a variable. Sorry, I'm writing in a different computer, so I'm not that fast. OK, and then I can pass that here. You see how the two are the same, right? That doing this <coughs> is the same thing as doing this. Sorry. Oh, crap. Sorry. This. Yes? It's, all we're doing is passing the same function, but by name rather than directly. So then this function can perform some task. Let's have it take an input, like, I don't know, b. And let's have it, actually, no, we don't even need an input here. Let's just have it call, you know, return a 6. Fine. So what this means is that when we take a, when we call f, we can return the result of calling a. Again, look, we have a function. We give this function as an input, that is to say we stick it in the hole of this function here. It receives that through A. Therefore, A now has this function inside of it. We can then call A, in other words, call this function that was passed to it, getting back some value, and then we're returning that value. So if we call A, what do we get back? What is the result of executing this here? Six, right? Look, this is the function. It goes here, then it goes there. And then we run it, and it returns a six. Therefore, this turns into a six. Therefore, running f here will return, if we console log it, a six, as you see. Right? That, again, this is the same thing as calling a. Notice it's the same thing. Any, is this confusing to anyone? Raise your hand if it is. It's OK. All right, good. OK, so the idea is this. Remember, we had this notion of a box, right? That had like a hole and two holes, right? Where we could pass inputs and we can get outputs. Well, in the same way that I wrote a number and I put something in the hole, I could just take another box, another function, if you will, and put it in the hole. So now you have a box inside of a box. And that box can use that box to do something. This is the case here, right? We have this function that we're passing into this f, this function, this box. And then f, being this, is using that function somehow. It could do something else. It could do a multiplied times a, the result of calling a, that is to say. In other words, what you're doing is you're running this function here, which is giving you a 6. You're running this function here, which is giving you a 6. And then you're obviously doing 6 times 6, which is 36. Right? OK, cool. The other thing that we realized is in the same way that we can pass as an argument a function, we can also receive a function as output. That is to say, the function can return another function. Here's an example. So suppose uh, here we actually don't take any arguments. And instead, what we're going to do is return return a function. Let's get rid of all this other stuff. If I call f, what do I get back? Right. Look, it's returning that, right? If it's confusing to you, think of it this way. What does f return now? A 1, right? OK, now instead of 1, I'm just returning a function. 
Okay, sounds reasonable, I think. Okay, so then let's have this function do something, like, I don't know, return a 10. So that means r is now the, this function here, which I can call. And I can do cons r2, and what is in r2 now? 10, cool. Now watch this. I could do this. What is an r? What do you think? Yeah, because think of it this way. Think of it as, here, let me simplify it for you. Think of it in mathematical terms, right? You do this one first. What does this part return? Function. The function, right? Then this part acts on that function. This is no different than if instead of returning a function, we were to return a, you know, a 10 or an, let's say a 7, and then here after calling it, we were to you know, add a 6. What would be an R now? Right, 7 plus 6, 13, right? Okay, that is, so in the same way that we can take the result, this function that is returned by calling this and do something, we can in the same way do that. So this part will return that function. This part will then call that function. Make sense? To whom does this not make sense? Yeah, it's okay? Okay, very good. All right, so this was sort of the, the beginning, right? We, we talked about, the next thing we talked about was scoping, right? Variable scoping. And one example that I brought up is this idea of currying, where a function can return a function, can, which can also return a function. You guys remember that one? Let's, let's look at it again. So let's have this function take an argument like A. Let's have this function take an argument like B and have this return another function, which takes an argument, C. And have it then return, return, A plus B plus C. Okay, now, if I were to call F, what would I get back? Function. The function. Look, this F is this function, correct? Mm -hmm. What does this function return? Well, look inside, look, it does return, this guy, right? Therefore, the result of calling this, uh, f1, let's say, f1 is now this function here, right? Now, if I were to call f1, what would I get back? Yeah, look, if this function, if I call this function, what does it return? Well, look inside, look, it returns a function. Okay, interesting, so I get another function. So then, what happens when I call f2? Uh-huh. Now, in this case, if I were to do const you know, f3, for example, what do you think would go into f3? Yeah, look, we didn't pass a value here, right? Which means a has no value, which in JavaScript, if you remember, is undefined, right? We then called f1 again with no value, which means b does not have a value. Ergo, it is undefined. Same thing in this case, right? C does not have a value, therefore it is undefined. Fair enough. So let's print what F3 will give us. Console.log F3. There it is. Makes sense, right? Nan, not a number. You can't add up undefines. That doesn't make sense. Remember, if one of them was string, then it would try to concatenate, right? Then it would turn undefined into a string and try to stick it together. But that's not the case here. Here we're just trying to add undefined to undefined to undefined, the result of which is not a number. What are you doing, right? It's a mistake. Okay. So fair enough. So instead, let's give it values. So instead, let's give, you know, let's have A receive a 2. Let's have this one, which is that one, right? Receive, I don't know, a 6. And let's have C receive a 9. Right? So in this case now, we're, well, if A, whoop. So in the first, oh, I'm sorry, this scroller is really. OK. All right. The first time we call F, we go in here. A has a value of 2. We then return this function. Then we call this one, which is with a value of 6. So B now has 6, we return this one. Then we call that one here, and we give it a 9. So C now has a 9. Um, 
and we return this. Now, interesting, and this is where scoping comes into play. When we look at A, does A exist that hasn't been created anywhere within this function? No. No. What do we do when we cannot find a variable? No. We go up one, right? We go up to the parent scope. Okay, so the parent scope, the thing outside of this box here, is this box here. Does this part, this section here, does that guy contain an A? No. 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 So we go up one more, and we end up here. And does that part contain an A? Yes, yes there it is, right there. Voila, A. Okay, and we know that A was 2 because we passed it, so we receive a 2. Therefore, A is interpreted as a 2. B, we do the same. Is there a B in this scope? No, we go up one. Is there a B? Yes, it is. It's right there. And B was passed in here, so it's a 6. Therefore, B becomes a 6. C is easy because we have it in our local scope. Pay attention to the words I'm using because you will hear these. Local scope means the scope you're in, okay? Parent scope is your, duh, parent scope, right? Makes sense, good. Okay, so C has a value of nine, so we give it a nine, and then this is evaluated, and therefore the result of that is put into F3, and we get 17. And let's go back to, does this undo? <laughs> yes, all right. Now, interestingly, suppose I had another constant, uh, d, which had a value of you know, 20. And I did plus d here. Would this work? Yes, yes. why? Because d has been defined. Well, first of all, you're right. So, good point. So, another term, global scope. So, the global scope is the scope that is like above everything else, right? It's the parent scope. It's not the parent. It's the it's the outermost, John, thank you. It's the outermost scope. Yeah? It's the scope that wraps everything else. And remember, using the rule that I described, it works because if you don't have D locally, you go up to your parent. It doesn't have it. You go up to that parent. It doesn't have it. You go up to the very top, which is your global scope, and you find D and you receive 20. That makes sense. Now question, suppose here, before I return this function, I created another function, const f, f, um, which inside had a variable const e. Can we reach e from, I don't know, can we do plus e? Can we do that? No. Why? Exactly. Because the scope of e is inside the function f. Yes, exactly. So draw a box around this. If you are not inside of that box, you cannot see it. In this case, we're not inside. We're outside, right? We're siblings, right? This function is next to this. It's not inside of it. Therefore, if we, if we try to find e, here's what we do. Does e exist here? No. We go up one. Does E exist in this block, the block that begins here and ends here? No. no. We keep going up. Does it exist in this block, the one that starts here and here? No. no. Does it exist in the global scope, the big block? No. We cannot find E. It's an error. Right? Does that make sense? OK. Remember, again, the analogy that I made about rooms. Right? I said, if I show you something and you are in the room, you can see it. Right. If you uh, create a smaller room with windows, um, you can still see through the windows the thing I'm showing you, right? But if you're in another room next door, you cannot see in here. You have to be in the room to see what I'm showing you. Block scope works exactly the same way. You have to be within the, the block in order to be able to see it. Yes, sir? Even if we return E, it also will not see E, right? If we re say that one more time? If we return E rather than create a variable. Ah, here if we return E. It will see FF, right? Rather than exactly. But you could do, exactly. Here, if you wanted to reach the value of E in this case, you could call FF. Yep. Because you have access to, again, does FF exist in this scope? No. No. Does it exist in this scope? Yes. Yeah, there it is, right there. 
So you can use that, and assuming that FF is exposing E, yes, you can get access to the value of E. Yeah. Very cool. Is this okay? Do you guys feel lost or confused? No. Okay, one really important thing I want you guys to understand is understanding variables, functions, scoping, basically the things we've done up until this point is absolutely fundamental for you guys to move forward in this class and everything else you will do in computer science or whatever else you're doing after. Because everything basically sits on top of this base. And if anything is unclear, you're confused about something, come to office hours, please. We will explain it, we will spend hours with you. Fine, no problem, but come so we can help you. We can't help you if you don't come. Yeah. Um, because if you miss it, if you're like, oh, I kind of feel lost and you kind of doze off, Next, we're going to be using these functions to build things. If you don't know how, what a function is, how are you going to use it? Right? How are you going to write it? How are, you going to, how are you going to do your final projects? How are you going to do all the homeworks? How are you going to write all the quizzes? You will fail immediately. Just If this is not clear to you, please come for extra help. We are here to help you. OK? Agreed? Yes? And what are you going to constant FF is function and as, uh, E as an argument? It will be OK? Uh, I mean, you could, y yeah, you could, you could do this. So this just means, you know what? I feel like some of you didn't exactly understand what arguments are to a function. Um, think of it this way. I like breaking eggs. <laughs> Something that I really like to do. That's my passion. Love breaking eggs. What I have is two hands. I don't have eggs, I have hands. The great thing about having two hands is you can give me two different eggs and I can break them. You can then give me like a big egg, a small egg, you know, an egg from a chicken, an egg from a, you know, different kinds of eggs, and I just take the eggs and break them. My hands are not eggs, right? They're hands. And you can put in them any kind of egg you want, and I will always perform the same function. I will take the eggs and break them. Yes? OK, now a function works the same exact way. Instead of hands, it has variables. It has, a, well, and variables just have a name, like A. This is the hand of this function. You can pass to it, instead of an egg, in this case, a number. You can give it a 1, you can give it a 10, you can give it a 1,000. Give it anything, and it will always do the same thing. In my case, I would take the eggs and break them. In this case, it takes the number and adds it to the other numbers. So in argument, think of it that way. It's the function that's going to do something that just has a hand that's like, give me a number, give me a number. It takes the number and goes, aha, and gives you the result. Okay? It's the hand. The hand is your variable. It's your argument. It's your input. It's not the value itself. The value itself is placed into the hand. So we can take it and do something with it. Yeah? Now, OK, coming back to this. Yes, you can just take an E and return an E. Sure. Uh, in that case, though, if we call FF, if we just do this, what will this return? Well, it's returning what I'm giving it. What am I putting into the hand? What am I putting into the hole? Nothing. Nothing. Undefined. So A, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, E in this case, is the hand. It looks inside, it goes, <laughs> there's nothing inside, and just goes, Neh. it just returns E, right? So E has nothing inside, and it returns E, which has nothing inside. Fair. So this will be undefined. And what do you suppose would be the result of running, the result of running this equation? Nah, because you're, tr you're adding a number to a number to a number to a number to an undefined. Nah, right? Okay, so now instead, let's give it a number like a six. Now it goes <laughs> six. And then it goes, nah. <laughs> That's it. It takes the six, the E, which has the six, and just returns E, which has the six. Okay, let's do something more interesting. Let's at least, you know, add a five to the value. So now it takes a value and adds a 5. If you give it a 6, it will give you 11. If you give it a 1, it will give you a 6. <laughs> right? 
you can put different things into the hand, different sized eggs, if you will, if it's me, right? Different values into the hand, and it will do an action that is slightly different depending on what you give it. This is what makes functions so interesting, so powerful, that you write your code one time, and you can use it with different values, and it will always compute. Yeah? So in this case, again, if we want to take, do the power of, you know, if you want to, uh, not swim, um, if we want to do e times e to the power of 2, yeah? we can just return e times e. There, we now have a function that does that. If we give it a 6, it's 36, right? If we give it a 5, it's 25. <coughs> we can give it any value, it will do the right thing. You guys understand functions now? Sort of? Okay. And did I answer? Yes. Yes, cool. Okay. Um, but the argument e itself, the variable e, if I were to literally just try to reference e from here, if I were to do this, you understand why, right? Because we're not inside of the block in which e was made, was created, or declared, is the fancy way of saying it. Got it? Yes? Okay. Questions up until this point? Okay, let's dive back into recursion then. So, what is recursion? Well, if you recall, a function can call another function. I think that's pretty clear, right? Why not? Um, if, I want, if you give me three eggs, right, I might you know, give two eggs to someone else and say, hey, you know, break them. Take the result and then you know, break the third one, smush them together and give you an answer. Give you the result of three eggs broken. It's a random example, I know. Okay, let's do one that's not that random. Let's try to compute a factorial. Ooh, going back to math, what was factorial? Yeah, so you give it a number and it's like that number times one less than that, one less than that, one less than that, all the way until you get to one, right? You remember that? Factorial looks like this in mathematics. Yeah? So this is five times four times three times two times one. Okay, imagine if, like, how would we do this, you know, in programming? How would you do a fact? Yes, sir? Uh, I, I wanted to say. Oh, you want to give the answer? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wait. I, 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 <laughs> if you have the answer, that means you're good. Don't worry. Just wait, wait a moment. Okay, so one way to do it would be to um, say, okay, let's create, a, you know, some function, f, that takes a value. And it, what it does is returns val times val minus one. That is to say, you know, the, the number itself times one less. So if you give it a five, it will be five times four. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, this is basic mathematics. Yep. Thank you. There. Good. Yes, thank you. Otherwise, yes, you do five times five minus one. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, so good. That only solves a part of it, right? Um, so if we call f with a five, we'll get five times four. Um, okay, but now what? You know, we need some sort of a cyclical thing to then also multiply one less than that, and then one less than that, and then one less than that, right? Okay, so we need a cycle. And remember, in programming, whenever you're doing something in a cycle, in a loop, you have to be able to stop it. You have to have some condition that will end the loop. Otherwise, what you get is what's known as an infinite loop. It will try to loop forever. Right. OK, so first of all, when do we want to stop looping? Well, imagine that val is a number that keeps going down by 1. So you end up with 5, then 4, then 3, then 2, then 1, then 0, then negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. Neg we want to go down until 1, though, right? That's where we want to stop our loop. So what if we made a condition? And how do we make a condition? If val is equal to 0, for example, or equal to 1, either one will work. Let's say equal to 1. Uh, let's return. Val, val. return val. If it's 1, let's return 1. Let's assume 0 will not be called by this function. Just make it simpler. OK, so great. OK, so now we have a function that if we call it with a 1, it will work. It will return a 1. 
If we, were to, if we call it with an 8, it will do 8 times 7. Right? Right now, the way it's written here. Okay. But obviously, that's not what we want. What we want is 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times, right? So we need some looping construct. So what we want to do, if you think about it, is to multiply value times the factorial of that value minus 1. Think of it this way. Factorial, factorial 7 is exactly the same as 7 times factorial of, factorial of 6, which is exactly the same as doing times uh, 6 times factorial of 5, right? So you notice something. We keep repeating the operation. This is known as recursion. We keep trying to do a factorial of the next thing. So what we want to do, again, remember, going back to this example, 7 factorial is the same as 7 times 6 factorial. Right? Now let's turn this into code. Val is 7. That's not 6. That's not 6. Sorry. <laughs> Six factorial. Good. Sorry. Sorry. Factorial is on the right. My apologies. Okay. G good. We're, we're happy? All right. Okay. So seven factorial, to compute seven factorial, what you have to do is multiply that value times the factorial of one less. This is mathematically sound. Everyone agrees? Yes? Okay. So let's turn that into programming, into code. Val is 7. Let's just say we're going to call it with a 7 here. So when it goes in here, val is going to be 7, right? Is val equal to 1? No, so we skip it. So we're doing 7, remember, 7 times factorial of 1 less. So let's do the factorial. In fact, remember how I told you naming is important? Like, what the crap is f? Why don't we call it? Uh-huh, now this is looking a lot better. See? Did, did I write it correctly? Okay, so now, okay, we're doing 7, which is the value, times factorial of 7 minus 1 is 6. Looks correct. And then when we go in here for 6, we do, that's the same thing as 6 times, right? This then resolves to 6 times the factorial of 6 minus 1, which would be 5. So 5, and then put that on the right. Yes? Okay. And then when we go into that function again with a 5, is 5 1? Is 5 1? No, right? 5 is not equal to 1. So we do 5 times the factorial of 5 minus 1. So we therefore, we do 5 times, this resolves to 5 times the factorial of 5 minus 1, which is 4. We then go again into here, and we keep doing this until eventually the number becomes a 1. And we eventually, after you know, many iterations, do times 1. And that's where the cycle ends. We, do, we no longer continue looping. Let's check to see what the result of factorials, oh, not f, factorial 7 is, const result. What do I want to do with the result? Let me print it. So I'll do console.log result. There it is. Okay, let's do a, a number that's smaller. Uh, 3. 3 times 2 times 1. Magic. You notice how the value can change? The size of the egg that you give me can change. I'm still going to break it. This is the idea. The number that you give it can be different, but it still does its job. It doesn't care. If you give it a 5, it will work. If you give it a 4, it will work. Make sense? Um, OK, so let's try with a 9. Ooh, that's a big number. Wow, numbers tend to go 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 40, no. <laughs> um, okay, so you guys understand recursion now? Yes? Is there a way to throw numbers? 
Is there a number limit too? Okay, so, uh, yes and no. Okay, let me explain something. How does this actually work? Let's go into the debugger and let me show you guys something because it's, it's something worth noting. This has to do with the way memory is managed in your execution engine. So watch. If we go to inspect here, Hello. Hang on. Well, how do I Let's put it at the bottom? Uh, let me move something. I'll make it bigger. Don't worry. Okay. Wait. 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 Oh, too big. Okay. Make that smaller. Make this bigger. Okay. Look. Let's let's watch how this works. Um, so we go in here and we go into this factorial function, right? So we go boom. So now val has a value of four, right? Is val equal to one? Of course it isn't. So we go next. So now we're doing val times the factorial of val minus one. Remember in math when I wrote just, it's like seven factorial is the same thing as seven times factorial of, or seven factorial, six factorial. 7 factorial is the same thing as 7 times 6 factorial. Yes? Yeah. Same thing here. Look, 7, it, we gave it, a, sorry, in this case we gave it a 4, is the same thing as 4 times factorial of 4 minus 1, which is 3. Starting to make sense, right? So now let's go into this function. You notice there's this thing called a call stack. Let's keep going. Let's go again. Ooh, there's another one. Let's go again. Ooh, there's another one. What is happening here? Well, it turns out that the operating system, so this is a bit of system theory, just so you guys understand. How does memory get allocated? When your process is executing, when you're running your program, the operating system gives you memory. It says, here you go, you can put stuff in it. Yay. The memory is divided into two parts. It's one part is called a stack, another a heap. And the two memories grow this way, against each other. Putting heap aside for a moment, let's talk about the stack. What is a stack? A stack, in data structures you will learn what a stack is, but think of it as like one thing on top of the other. That's a stack, okay? So what goes onto a stack? When you're running a function, all the variables of that function all the memory that you use to run that function is stored on the stack. Then your function calls another function. That function also needs memory to create its local variables, right? Therefore, another piece of thing is put on top of that stack. More memory is allocated on top of that stack to reserve space for the, all of those variables. Then that function calls another function. Another piece is added to that stack. And in this way, the stack keeps growing. If you're doing recursion and you're looping 10 times, every time you call a function, you're, make, you're adding another thing to that stack. Then when the function returns, that is to say finishes and all the variables are removed, the memory is cleared from the stack and you go to the next one. Cleared from the stack and you go to the next one. And in this way, the stack grows and shrinks over time. Now the problem is, if you do recursion over, say, a thousand items or a million items, you're calling a function that's adding a, something to the stack, you're calling a function again, adding something else to the stack, calling a function again, again, again. If you do it a million times, eventually your stack will overflow. Your stack only has a limited amount of memory. If you just keep adding things to it, eventually you overflow it. Right? And there are errors, and you get basically your application just dies. It crashes. So there is no loop. Not in recursion and not without an optimization, which is called tail call optimization. I'll, I can tell you about that at office hours. I don't want to. But anyway, so this is a limitation of recursion without an optimization that basically says don't put things on the stack. That's a separate thing that we can discuss later. Yes? So what about numbers? This is about functions, memory, right? Yeah. How, how, Ah, yes, there is a limitation to the number. I don't exactly remember what it is, but uh, JavaScript number size. 
One second. Google will tell me. What is a JavaScript highest integer? <laughs> Let's see. Look, there's a website called Stack Overflow. We know what Stack Overflow is now, right? It's when you blow the stack, when the stack goes too far. And... OK, so the answer is that. So we can store a much larger factor of the. This is the limit to what you can do in JavaScript. If you store anything bigger than that, there's a problem. Um, yeah, there's no like long. I know in, in Java, I think there's long. It's, I don't know what there is in C++. Anyway, OK, so you get the idea. So what this means is that we can't have a recursion that's too deep. So to answer your question, I think someone asked, like, can we put some ridiculous large number in here? No. Actually, we will blow the stack. We will cause a stack overflow error. OK, for those of you who didn't understand that part, don't worry. That's, it's not, I'm not going to quiz you on it. Just be aware that this is an issue. Um, OK, so recursion. Yes? But what will happen if we write return, uh, return factorial value? If we just do return factorial value? Ah, good question. So what she's saying is, so, so suppose instead of doing val times factorial val minus 1, we were to simply do factorial val. OK, let me cause like an error somehow, like, so it doesn't run. And here we just do this. Yeah, it's an infinite loop. Think about it. So what is val? Well, he, in this case, val is 4, right? So we come in here, val has 4. Is 4, 1? No. So we call the function again with 4. Is 4, 1? So we come again and call them 4. And we just keep them. We just keep looping. Yeah? You sure? Hi, Jeff. Uh, should we write uh, else if before return? Good question. So what he's saying is, so if we, we learn that you can have an else construct, for example, I mean, you don't really need an if, because that's the only other case you have, right? You could just do else. You can do it this way. This is also completely OK. But the thing is, if you think about it, what do we mean by else? Else means only run that if the if fails, right? But if you think about it, if the if does not fail, you're going to return. That's going to stop the function. So the else will, like, the rest of the code is not going to happen anyway. So this is actually exactly the same, in this case, as this. If I didn't return here, you're right. This, we, we would need an else here, right? But because I'm not, I'm returning, I'm stopping the code. If it ever goes into the if, it returns and done. If it fails, then it goes in here. So you automatically get an else, basically, out of that. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. You sure? OK. Uh, what if we are putting negative numbers? Ah, so good question. So in this case, actually, I'll pose it to the audience. You guys tell me. What would happen if I passed, instead of a 4, if I did this? Right. In this case, for this code. Right, it's an infinite loop. Think about it. Because you get negative. OK, let's go back to um, the actual working function. OK, so let me break this. OK, so now if we do negative here, negative 4, for example, right? What would happen? Well, you, negative 4 goes in here, right? Is negative 4 1? No. So we do negative 4 times negative 4 minus 1 is negative 5. We go in here, negative 5. Is negative 5 equal to 1? No. And we keep doing this, but notice we're moving away from 1. So it's going to keep going. That's a joke. How, but it's infinite loop make up. Actually, the problem isn't. So what he's saying is, first of all, there's a logic error because we keep flipping negative to positive, positive to negative, as we multiply negatives and, and so on, right? Every other one. Hmm? Right. But he, he means 
what we're trying to return is constantly going to flip. But the problem is it's never actually going to return because it's constantly going to loop and compute the next one. So what you've ha you have now is an infinite loop. It will never return. Because before returning, it's going to compute the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and, then, and it just keeps going. The, yes, sir? Vectorial is defined only in positive, non-negative numbers, right? So we can add, uh, or where, well, like, uh, when it is less than zero? Yes, absolutely. So one thing we could do is known as error checking. Error checking means you check the arguments that you get to make sure that they're okay before you do your work. It makes sense, right? If my job is to break eggs and you give me rocks, right? And I'm like, okay. So one thing I might want to do is when you give me eggs, check, is it an egg? If it's not an egg, tell you, dude, you know, eggs, please. If it is an egg, great, <laughs> right? Okay, so in this case, what we can do is say if, you know, val is, um, well, first of all, we can do type of, type, type of val is the same thing as a number. By the way, what type of, what is type of? What does it look like to you? Yeah, but what is it, but it's, it looks like a function, right? So let's treat it like one. So let's treat it as a function that takes a value and returns a string that, that says what it is. So in this case, if it's, if it's not a num number, if it's not a number, what's something that a factorial cannot be? Can it be a negative one? No. No, right? So why don't we have negative one be reserved for error? Basically, if you call factorial and you get back a negative one, you know something happened. Something's weird. Don't think undefined. Yeah, or we can do it, right? Or we can return undefined, true. We could just return, which is the same thing as returning undefined. Um, we can also, okay, so this will just check if it's a number. We can also check if the val is greater than zero. Or equal. Or equal, okay. Yeah, but in that case, we have to account for this case. We have to do if is equal to zero, uh, then return one. Right? With me? Okay, so if it's greater than or equal to zero, sorry, if it's less than zero, then also... Sorry, one sec. Also returned undefined, right? And only if the value is a number, and that number is greater than zero, then and only then should we loop. Yes, sir? Uh, I didn't get this type of while well thing. So we say if the type of while well equals to a string. No, no, okay, so type of is a function which gives you back text that says what it is, the value that you gave it. So in this case, if I give it a seven, I will be a string that says a number. Okay. It will give me seven. If I give it, you know, ABC, it will give me a string that says uh, string. string. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so if it, now instead of writing two if statements, I could do something a little smarter. Go. And, John, exactly. So instead of writing two if constructs, I could just put this, but in this case, we want or. or. There you go. Now I can, if I can learn to scroll. How do you scroll with this thing? Oh my god. Sorry. Okay, good. And now we can remove uh, this guy. There, see? Make sense? So if the number is not a num, if the number, if the value is not a number, or that number is less than zero, don't do anything. Return nothing. Say, you know, no. But if it is, if it is a number and it's, you know, greater than zero, or greater than or equal to zero, then okay, we can do something. So that's when we begin our operation. Yes? No, uh, no, because NAN, NAN is not a type. NAN is a value. Um, so what you can do is, if you want to check to see if something is NAN, you say, you call a function called is NAN, and you give it a value. So if is NAN returns true, remember, things that begin with is 
functions that begin with is typically give you a Boolean result, right? Is this building, you know, red? No, false. Is, you know, this computer, you know, a laptop? True, yes, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So is, so is nan, is the value you gave it a nan? True, yes, or you get it, right? Okay, so in this case, we're checking to see that the input is a number, that it is not a nan. Um, in other words, if it's not a number, or it's a nan, or it's less than zero, we don't do anything. In all other cases, we continue, and we do our work. Sorry. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, you're next. Go. Me out there, John? Function val times function val. Uh, tell me, tell me what to write and where. In she in she talk it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Factorial, you mean? Ah, oh, stair get in factorial. Hence val to val minus one. Okay, do will you tell me what will happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 I want to think about it for a minute. <coughs> Look, here's what you're telling me. You give me a big egg, and then to break. I then tell myself to break the egg. And I give it the egg. I then tell myself to break the egg, and I give myself an egg. And then I tell myself to break the egg, and I give... Look what's happening, look. Val, let's say you call it with a four. Four goes in here. First thing, is four a num not a number? It is a number, right? Okay, is, is it an n? No. Is it, uh, if we keep going, less than zero? No. So, okay, so we keep going. Is it zero? Is four a zero? Yes or no? No. So then what we do is we call the function with a 4. Is 4 any of these things? No. <laughs> is 4 a 0? No. We call the thing with a 4. Is four, You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> now what you could try to do is do val minus 1. That's interesting. You guys, now you get a tree effect, right? Is what you're doing is your factorial function is trying to do, yeah, 7 factorial, so 7 factorial times 7 factorial, which then in turn is trying to do 6 factorial times 6 factorial, and you get this crazy number at the end. Okay. Two, this would be... Let's do it. Factorial val minus one times factorial val minus one. Ah, this is what's happening. Because at the end, all of them return a 1, and so you do 1 times 1, and you get a 1. That's what, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Here's what's happening. If you do, what is the result of calling this? Right? It's the result of, it, let's say we call this with a 2. Let's say, you know, this is a 3, so you, you, this turns into a 2, and you get a 2 here, right? Then you come here. It's not, 2 is not 0, so you come here and you do a 1, and you come here and it's not a 0, and you keep going until it is 0 and you return a 1. So then eventually that 1 is multiplied times the previous same thing, which is a 1. So what you get is a whole bunch of 1 times 1 times 1 times. If we did plus instead of multiply, then you would see basically the number of leaves that you have. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, love. Wait, let's come back to yes. Uh, 
Okay. Aha. Der ist aus Gaza. Du kannst Gaza. Good. Okay. Um, the rest of you. Yes, I'm sorry, you had a question. No. Look, the, what does the first condition check? It checks that. You tell me, what does this mean? Right. So the first thing it checks is, is the value a number? Right? Which, of course, is not the same as checking if a value is zero. Right? No. Because is nan is trying to check to see if a given number is nan. If you give it a text like 55, like ABC, it will actually give you true. Because it's trying to check to see is it a number that is also a nan. You understand? Again, it's a weird thing. I agree with you, but that's the behavior. Yes? If we, wait, should I go back to the original? This version, okay. If we gave it a seven, uh, 128, yeah. Oh, you want me to debug through this now? Okay. Yeah, let me give it a two. Okay, so a two will give us a four. Okay. Huh? Wait, wait, wait. Are you, is four okay with you? Is this correct? No. Okay, let's see why it's not correct. Fair, fair, fair. So we have a debugger statement, so let's figure this out. So if you don't agree with the computer, what you do is you step and you see why it gave the value it gave, right? So debugger is what you would use. So let's see. Ta -da. Do you see the code from where you are? You can see it. It's okay? Okay. So uh, the first thing we do is we go into factorial 2. We check if it's a number and all that stuff. Yes, it is. Is it a zero? No, because it's a two. Fine. We then, we're going to evaluate this part first. So we dig into the left side of the equation. So factorial of two minus one. What does that give us? It, is it zero? No. So what we do is we do the factorial, again, remember the left side, of 1 minus 1. That will then return a 0, right? You'll see it in a moment. Exactly. So bear with me. So we would get a 1 from there, right? OK, so this part is a 1. We have another one to the right that we have to do. Yes? OK, so again, we do 1 minus 1, which will give us a 0. So this part is also going to give us a 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2. Agreed? OK, so we go in here. Um, and we're going to return a 1. Okay. So now we've returned from that original 1. And now we have to go to the right part of that first one where val was, wait, val is 2. We now have to go into, yeah, remember val was 2? We now have to go into the right part of val is 2. Look, the equation has a left side and right side, right? When you go into the left side, that also has two equations, the left side and the right side. And you keep having to go down this tree, sum up the result, and then you have to do the right side. So, so far, the left side, we got a two. Are you with me? Hot the chair. Ah. Okay, so now we're going down the right side. Two minus one will give us a one. That's why we have a one here. 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. What, does, what is the result of doing factorial 1 minus 1? In charge of No, look. Val, if val is 0, what do we return? Ah. Okay. So to continue, what, it, what then, so you will get val minus 1, which is 0, plus 1 minus 1, which is 0. Factorial of those is 1 plus 1. So you get two. So the left side is two, the right side is two, you add them together, you get four. Yeah? Two. In the line of return, it works simultaneously or first it counts the first part and that's the second. Yeah, it always does. It, look, 
Um, it's exactly like mathematics. Think of math, right? If you have some really complicated you know, mathematical equations inside of brackets, you do those first and then you do the next, right? Imagine you're just doing pluses. It's always left to right, yes? You're going this way. Uh, always left to right. And until you're done with the left, you do not look at the right. Agreed? Same thing here. It's always left to right unless you put it in parentheses. The same rules as in math. Same. So in this case, if I were to do, like, if I were to put the, this into, like, a bracket like this, you know, and do, you know, something else, like this times 1, what this would do is, uh, here we go, it would run this, then it would run this, then it would run the result of that times 1, times, then it would add the two sides together. It's making sense? Yes or no? Yeah? Okay. Also, yeah, you can do it. Sure, sure. Yes, of course. Let's do it. Uh, let's change this back to a regular factorial. So let's have this be val times uh, factorial of val minus 1. So this, as you recall, is a regular good old-fashioned factorial function. Yes? Watch this. Okay. Because, the, okay, two is not a good example. Oh, that's a huge number, huh? Factorial of four? Factorial of four. Ah, you turn meds Tiva. Okay, let's do a three. Okay, better. Now, if this looks scary to you, it shouldn't. All you're saying is this. Run this first. Here, I can do it separately. Look, I can do this. Const. And then put r into this. Look, I ran this. I put the result into this. And then I pass that as an argument to the factorial. Is this clear? This is exactly the same as doing that. There is, it's the same. Ah, and, okay. Function image functioning. Function image functioning. Ah, say sa, wait. Sa, I sa. Ave nuina, inch best for sa. Amazon. Cool. Yes. Okay, let's. I understand what you're saying. Look, let's go through the exercise. If you factorial of one, this part here, right? What happens? Well, actually, why don't we open a debugger and you can see exactly what happens when the debugger decides to open? Okay. Okay. Look. So the first time when I hit the the down button, it's going to go into this one, right? Because we have to do this one to then produce the result that will get passed into this one. Agreed? Okay, so let's go into the one that says factorial 1. So now val has 1. And what we do is we say, okay, 1 times, value times, factorial of 1 minus 1, which is 0. And if you recall, if val was 0, we're going to return a 1. So let's see that. Yes, it is. It's 1. So 1 times 1 will give you 1. So yes, you're right. Factorial of 1 gives you 1. Then, when you return from this, you go into the parent, so the result of this part was 1. So you're calling factorial again with a 1, and you will get the same result. So factorial with factorial 1 will give you 1. I don't know if I answered your question. I was asking about that condition. For example, we can write if val equals to 0 or equals to 1. Ah, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Very good point. An optimization that could be done, in fact, 
is instead of calling a function again when you have a 1 just to get a 0 and then get a 1 again, if you think about it, that's a bit redundant, isn't it? If this, this results in factorial getting called again with a 0 just so we can get back a 1 again so we can return a 1. We can do better. So one thing we could do is not only check 0, but also check 1. Because if it's 1, factorial of 1 is what? Right. So why call a function again just to know that? Right? Right, which is why we have this, this here. It's or. No, OK. And would mean that the number has to be 0 and it has to be 1, which would never happen, of course. Right? So it's or. Gam. Gam tiva zroya, gam tiva mega. OK? Is this clear? Questions up until this point? OK, we know factorial. Very cool. Let's see what time it is. Ooh, not a lot of time. OK, let's do a few more things here and then. So OK, I guess objects and arrays will move on to Tuesday. We'll work on them on Tuesday. Today, let's work on functions a bit more just to make sure you guys really understand functions. And then I'll give you a nice homework assignment where you can write functions, recursive functions. Yes. OK. Here's a fun one. Let's draw something. OK. Check out my awesome ASCII. Uh -huh. Whoa, that's pretty, right? Okay. That's so cute. Interesting. Okay. So if I wanted to draw a, a triangle like this that was, say, you know, 10 deep, I would have to write a whole bunch of these console logs with a different number of stars in them, would I not? Let's do something smarter. We now understand looping, right? We understand recursion. What if I were to say, you know what? Write a function where I just give you depth, like 10, and you draw a triangle that is of that height, 10. So at each level, you're just adding one more star, right? So on the first level, you would have one star, second two, or that number plus one, third row, that number plus one, fourth row, that number plus one, and you keep doing this until you finish at whatever number I told you. Yeah? Uh, homework will be more advanced than, yes, we will be more involved. But for now, let's do something a bit simpler. Um, so how can we do this? Does anyone try? Tell you what, first thing I want you to do is just draw a line like this. with the depth that I give you. So if I give you 10, I want you to draw 10 stars. If I give you 100, I want you to draw 100 stars. If I give you 1,000, I want you to draw 1,000 stars. How could we do this? First off, write the function. Okay, one rule I don't want you guys to forget. We, do not, we only use const. Yeah. So I, I heard someone say while. You can't use while if you're using const. There's no state change. Recursion, good. So tell me. Create a function. Good. So anytime you want to write a recursive function, you create a function. Haha. -ha. Let's give it a name. Stars. Haha. <laughs> Count stars. Cool. Okay. Stars. Okay. Do your time good. Yes. Now, remember, anytime you're doing recursion, you need two things. Remind me? The recursive case, the part that does the cycle, and the termination case, the part that is going to stop the cycle. Which comes first? The termination case, the part that stops the cycle. So let's write that. When do we want to, remember I'm going to give you the height, like how many stars I want, right? So let's do num stars or num rows, number of rows, num rows. When do we want to stop? Okay, well, let's say I give you 10. 
I think greater than me, which is less than or equal to zero. Also, okay, so if num rows is what? Okay, but here, no, like if I start with 10, at each iteration, I have to change something, right? I have to pass a variable that's a little different. What if I did minus 1 and I kept doing that until I got to 0? Would that work? No. Also in Tasat Tabi. Tasirta Tapumas, in your Tapumas, who tear to Tapumas, in your Tapumas, in your Meg. So if num rows, how about what we end on 0? Because we want to include 1. So if num rows is equal to 0, we're going to stop. What's an easy way to just stop a function? Return. Cool. So, so now let's do the recursive case. Remember, recursive means, oh, we have to print a star. Duh. Console.log star. OK, we're printing a star. Beautiful. Now, this, what will this do if I just ran this? If I just did you know, stars and I gave a 10? It will give a line of stars? Anything else? OK, I got infinite. What else? It will give one star, dude. Look, it just goes in here. Follow the logic. Num rows is 10. Is 10 to 0? No. Console log a star. <laughs> That's it. What we want is to now loop again and call this function again. But remember, num rows has to change. It has to approach 0 so that eventually we can stop. If we do plus 1, we will go away from 0 and never end. Right? OK, so why don't we do that? How do I call the same function? You can return, but sure, we can return, but it doesn't matter because we're not actually getting anything back. We're just, this is an example of a function that doesn't give anything back. It just does something, which is print. Huh? I don't know. Stars. OK, let's, let me break this so I don't kill my browser. Um, num rows. Beautiful. Why? What would happen if I did this? Just a loop. A loop, right? If I give it a 10, it's going to come here, print a star, or try to print a star. I'll tell you why it doesn't. Um, then you'll come here, call with a 10, come here, print a star, 10, come here, print a star, 10, come here, print a star, 10. And it will just keep doing this. And because it's using all the entire thread, that is to say it's just running its thing, it's just computing, 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 the part of the browser that tries to draw the stuff on the screen will never actually run because you're busy hogging the, the, the computation. OK, so what we need to do is have num rows approach 0 so eventually we can stop it, right? So the first time is 10, fine. Next time we want something less. What if we did minus 2? Right, we get two times fewer stars. Look. See? We got five. Why? Because we, first, we, this is 10, we do a star. Minus two. Eight, we do a star. Go here. Six, we do a star. We keep doing this until we get to zero. Therefore, we only actually go into this part five times. What if I did minus three? What would I get? Very good. Think about it this way. If I did a negative, let me break this so if I were to do minus 3 here, look what happens. 10 goes in here. We print a star. So far, so good. Minus 3, we get 7. We go in here, print a star. Minus 3, we get 4, right? Print a star, come here, we get a 1. Come here, this is a 1. Is 1 equal to 0? No, right? We print a star. 1 minus 3. Minus 2. Is it equal to 0? On some. Who can that? Right, right, right. So if you give it a value that when you do subtract, eventually you get to 0, you're OK. By the way, what's an easy way we can just prevent this problem? 
Right, we can just do if num is less than or equal to zero. Now, if we jump to negatives, it's still okay. Right? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So let's do, if I give you 10, I want 10, right? So what do I do? Minus one, maybe? Uh, let's change this to stars. And we get 10. Look. Ooh. If I gave you, instead of 10, I gave you 40 or 50, I will get 50 stars. Whee! Okay. <laughs> It's 2.45. Let's take a photo.